so to, to kick us off, just thank you very much, first of all, to, to Biza for hosting us. Um, it's really nice to have this session where we can get together and, and talk about you know, a topic that is, is very interesting and important to us all. And thank you for the Post-Structuralist Politics Working Group for, for recommending um, our, our project to, to Biza for this purpose. Um, and I hope we have a wonderful discussion throughout the afternoon here but morning in the United States. Um, to kick us off basically we're going to use a very interactive format without the kind of normal standard presentations. Um, this is a, a special issue that has just come out in critical military studies. Um, it's a double issue so not everybody in the issue is presenting today. It's called Curating Conflict, Political Violence in Museums, Memorials and Exhibitions. And it's uh, exploring how curated memories of conflict can offer us an insight into uh, the curation of political communities, of political identities, and all of the contestation that goes, uh, goes along with this. Um, so we've got speakers from different parts of the special issue with us today. Um, some of them from, from part one that looks at hegemonic curation um, by kind of imperial military powers and how they curate war in um, memorials, exhibitions, etc. Um, we've got some speakers from part two who look at unsettling war objects that kind of contest this hegemonic curation. Uh, and we've also got speakers from part three, which looks at resistance in curation, so counter hegemonic um, exhibitions and performances. And finally, also, we have um, one of our encounters authors. So um, critical military studies has an encounters section where shorter essays um, on more kind of um, artistic relevant themes can be um, presented. So we've got speakers from all four parts of the special issue. And I wonder if I could invite them uh, to introduce themselves one by one, which of course in this format is tricky. So I will call them one by one. And if you could just say, you know, your name um, and, and where you work basically, and a little bit about yourself before we begin. Um, shall we start with Desiree? Thanks Charlotte and hi everyone. I am Desiree Poets. I'm currently an assistant professor um, at the Department of Political Science at Virginia Tech and the core faculty of the ASPECT PhD program. And next, if we could go to Audrey. I'm Audrey Reeves and uh, my affiliation is exactly the same as Desiree's. And uh, next, could we go to uh, Candida and then Natasha? Hello, I'm Candida Purnell, and I'm an assistant professor in international relations from Richmond, the American University, no, the American International University in London. Very long uh, name. Hello, my name is Natasha Danilova, and I'm a lecturer um, at the University of Aberdeen. Thank you. And um, next, we go to Christine. Me? Uh, yeah, Christine Sylvester. I'm a professor at the uh, University of Connecticut, but I taught for quite a while in Europe, almost 18 years of my career, uh, including Lancaster University, where I met a lot of these people. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Perhaps if we go to Hon Enrique. Hi, everyone. I'm Enrique. I'm Enrique Furtado. I'm a senior lecturer in politics and IR at the University of the West of England. And last but not least, Francesca. Hi, my name is Francesca Burke. I'm a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Brighton. And Eileen, if you're there, this is your, your last call to introduce yourself. Maybe we've lost her for the moment. Hopefully she'll be able to, to join us again soon. Um, to begin, the first question I'd like to, to pose to our participants is for them to, to tell us about the contributions of their paper in the, in the special issue, but with a particular focus on how they came to research the curation of conflicts, 
um, and why this particular site or exhibition or artwork? So what is it about this site that, that really motivates them? Um, I'm going to try and stick to the order in which we introduced ourselves. So first up, could I go to Desiree? Sure, thanks, Charlotte. Um, OK, so I grew up in Rio in Brazil. And there you're surrounded by questions of actually it's pretty much an obsession with public insecurity that we experience um, there. It's everywhere in the media. It's a lot. Um, it's present in a lot of you know popular culture. And there really is a curation of a culture of fear in the city overall. And it really affects how you navigate the city, how you relate to the city, how I grew up there. So I was always surrounded by the problem of militarization, by the problem of public security, but always attached to the question of, of policing. And maybe, you know, we'll, we'll get to, to what it means to talk about policing instead of like foreign policy later, later on. But I was kind of, I grew up in this context of the so-called war on drugs. And I was always thinking about it. I was always dealing with it because it really shaped how I, you know, used public transport or not in the city and where I went and, and at what times and, and so on. So I was always thinking about this. Um, and basically I ended up, well, it was kind of by chance that I ended up um, writing about this specific site. Um, I ha do have some pictures that maybe will help kind of just situate for everyone where what sites I'm talking about. It, I, I wrote about the Museum of Mare, a community museum in the complex of Mare, which is um, a conglomeration of 16 favelas in the north zone of Rio de Janeiro in a very industrialized part. You can see if you land in Rio at the International Airport, you'll land here and the, the complex of Mare is here. It's got 140,000 residents, but also um, and I can move to this. It's also deemed one of the most dangerous communities in Rio because it counts with the presence of um, two drug factions and one militia, which are paramilitary organizations made up of current and former police officers. And so it's kind of often perceived as a problem of public security in Rio. And it's been one of the biggest targets of the you know, so-called war, war on drugs. And I ended up going there because I was um, documenting their 12th anniversary for an NGO that I work with, Rio on Watch. And I was just so taken by the museum. This is the museum, this is the entrance. Um, I, I walked in there and it starts, it opens with a panel where they, they say, you know, here, this is a, a place of life. We're going to tell the story of this community through these 12 cycles that are also themes and temporalities. And, um, when you enter, it's actually, it's a very different kind of museum. It doesn't have any captions. It doesn't have anything explained to you. All the images are offered to you, but there's nothing that says, this is what this means. This is what, you know, it doesn't tell you the narrative verbally, but you're, you're forced to kind of move around and touch things and play with the objects. Um, and here you see someone like, people were just kind of naturally just like grabbing things and everything is available. Nothing is like kept away from you. And I was just really moved and taken by this, by this museum because actually what it did for me was it, it immediately interrupted a lot of the discourses, the narratives, but also the emotions and the effect attached to, to militarization, which is this construction of places such as Mare as, as a threat, right? As the enemies of public security in Rio, in Brazil. And it just undid that without even centering the question of militarization. There is no, there is a cycle of fear of which I didn't take pictures at the time, but it doesn't talk about militarization. It doesn't center it to then critique it. It just tells you a story of the community that is really based on the life um, that, that residents experience and develop there. And so in that way, it was challenging um, the, the necropolitical, right? The politics of death of militarization in Rio in a way that was really moving um, in an embodied and emotional and effective way. And that's why I, I ended up writing about it and I've been writing about it since. So I think I'll leave it there so that others can, can add more. Perfect and wonderful pictures as well. Um, Audrey, can we go to you now? Thank you, Charlotte, um, for so many things, uh, but thank you for sharing today. Uh, my name is um, Audrey and uh, I, I was also involved with Charlotte in, in 
uh, co-editing this special issue and I'm really grateful for everybody who's here today and uh, the conversation we're having. And my object um, came, like my museum that really started this process for me, came into my life at the end of um, the International Studies Association Conference in 2012 in San Diego. At the end of the conference, um, my colleague uh, Saskia Stakovic told me there's a museum you're really out to see because the gender um, representations there are really quite flabbergasting. And um, she was referring to the USS Midway, um, which is an aircraft carrier located just next to the like conference hotel where the conference was taking place. And uh, this um, aircraft carrier was um, turned into a museum in the mid 2000s. And shortly after it placed um, a sculpture, a sculpture was placed um, next to the museum. And what I'll do is I will send, I will um, share in the chat a picture for those of you who would want to see. And uh, this sculpture shows um, a sailor embracing a white clad woman in a gesture that is um, that evokes this the photo taken by the live photographer um, Eisenstadt on victory against Japan day in 1945 where you um, you know that has been I iconic and um, represents the end of um, the war against uh, Japan in the United States. And so there's many interesting things here. The first thing is that the statue is monumental and uh, it's about um, six meters tall, like 30 feet tall. So um, like human beings next to the statue um, don't rise up to the woman's knee. They're about as high as her calf. And uh, the second thing is that um, the sculptor, the artist um, Seward Johnson, has decided to uh, transform the statue in, you know, in relation to the original photograph in many ways. So it's been made um, to look like a more uh, consensual encounter than um, we now know the actual encounter in Times Square where the original photograph was taken was. So the, the posture of the woman is more relaxed. She's holding flowers. Um, there, there's a number of like the embrace is also more gentle on the part of the sailor. So there's been a kind of erasure of violence here that is, that is quite interesting. And then the second interesting thing about this culture is that it, it exists in various versions. So there's also a, a life-size version that is placed next to the USS Missouri, um, which is the battleship uh, where the where Japan signed the surrender at the end of World War II, and which is also a museum uh, in Hawaii, in Honolulu. And uh, then the statue also travels. So it's traveled to Europe, it's traveled to uh, Belgium, Italy, France, Britain, and usually to memorials and sites um, associated with the commemoration of World War II. And when the um, statue traveled to France, to the memorial in Caen in Northern France, then it created a bit of an upheaval because local feminists, and I'm sharing another link with you here, did not agree with having the statue placed there because to them, the statue evoked the widespread uh, sexual assault against French women by GIs at the end of World War II. So it was remindful of the sexually violent nature of what was, yes, like a, a liberation, but also a form of occupation in France. And um, then more feminist activism happened most recently in 2019 when um, in Sarasota, Florida, where another version of the statue is exhibited, um, some activists graffitied hashtag me too on the leg of the, the, the woman in the sculpture. So I think I was interested in this object as a place where 
um, some forms of feminist resistance to US militarism was coalescing, but also existed simultaneously with a number of like, um, like positive, effective practices with people um, also uh, in other respects, um, really loving it uh, to have the statue there and, uh, you know, like staging um, like vow re renewals or staging like wedding ceremonies around it. So I think that in these kind of intimate encounters with the statue, we have interesting uh, things emerging in terms of the contestation and also legitimization of US militarism. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sergio, it, it's not just you. I didn't find the links in the chat either. Um, Audrey, maybe you could have a look when we move to Candida next. And uh, that, yeah, they're coming through now. You fixed it. OK, um, Candida, Natasha are doing a, a sort of double act. And I think Candida is taking uh, this question on behalf of the, the co-authors. Actually, Natasha's going to start and then we're going to go, Natasha, me, Natasha, me, Natasha, me. So thank you, Charlotte. Hello, I'll um, try to share screen. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I just wanted um, first to kind of show the title of the paper. It was about musification of the Scottish soldier. Uh, and the paper written in collaboration with Candida. Um, how I came about, because it's based on um, initially my project, I was a principal investigator on that. Um, and I think it's very much about my interest in military culture, which is located outside the military barracks. Um, I grew up um, in the Soviet Union, so in a highly militarized society, and yet I didn't have um, experience of military service. So for me, uh, military culture, it's very much culture which is outside the military. So it's the culture with which society engages on an everyday basis. And I think that um, was always my interest and I kind of curious to unpack how society engages the sites um, how it happens through cultural sites. And even I feel like um, discussion, for example, the in um, military studies, conventional military studies mili about military culture is very restrictive. It's usually kind of claims possession of, of this culture by military institutions. So this idea that it's improved cohesion of military units, but the uh, culture which exists outside it for me, even this argument is very problematic. Do not mention how society engages with it. So this paper looks at the military museums in Scotland. I um, moved to Scotland in 2015 to the University of Edinburgh. And I think what I was struck by, it's quite prominent sort of reverence of the soldier, the Finn and Scottish culture. And also you can see the picture, it's a picture from the Remembrance Parade and in front of the um, shop, which says heritage of Scotland. But what it tells me that the image of Scots as warriors is very much cultural, very popular cultural construct in Scotland. And the, what is curious and what we encountered during publishing papers on the basis of this project, that many people perceived um, this kind of martial Scottish identity as something which goes against, for example, is not supported by SNP um, against um, um, the governing party. But what we show that in Scotland, there is absolute support for this idea. <laughs> so this is shared by different political groups and so on. So it's very much present, it's, it's, it's identity. It's quite racialized concept because it's referring to martial race discourse and I would be talking about that and be talking about kind of co the colonization so I think it's a very interesting how it's unproblematized so why military museums I think it's also a realization that um you don't really realize how many military museums in Britain <laughs> and that I think um was um um so it's like 
for example, that there are over 140 uh, military museums in Britain, and most of them are regimental museums, former regimental museums. Right now, they completely lost connections with regiments simply because regiments were disbanded. So, for example, in Scotland, there are 10 museums, military museums, one of them National Museum of War located in the castle, but the majority of them former regimental museums. One museum which we included in our sample actually was in the borders in England, but it was in a very strange situation because originally it was connected to the Scottish regiment, it felt, um, so um, it kind of set in between, so we included it in the sample as well. So we analyzed 11 museums, but for us the idea was that this sample may be represented almost 90% of the museums in Scotland, because we took only museums with unrestricted access, so the public can visit them anytime. Um, we didn't go to um, kind of close regimental collections, although there are two, two of those. Um, but it's just to realize that there are much, much more museums spread out across the UK. And usually they almost never problematize as uh, sites which can be um, analyzed. And what we also encountered, it's the idea that museum, military museums exist for some um, military historian or people who just interested in, in whole, or who patriotic or belong to regiments or, who, or just excited about um, military history or memorabilia in a sense. But um, this, because during our research we encountered this phrase, well, if you don't like this kind of narrative, don't come. Um, just don't come. And what was interesting, again, um, in the start of the project, we interviewed one of our colleagues, uh, expert in museum studies, and he said exactly that. Well, um, yes, I know there are many museums, but you know, I never go there. Um, so we kind of encountered this idea that, well, don't go if you disagree. And it also was voiced by curators. So, well, okay, we sometimes have occasional people who don't like our exhibition, but really it's their problem. They can go somewhere else. But this view really dismisses the fact that modern military museums operate on a completely different scale. First and foremost, they dissociated from the military structures because they no longer link to the regiments. In Scotland, for example, there is only one regiment, Royal Regiment of Scotland, and therefore out of 11 museums, only one museum is connected to the regiment. So the majority of them are not connected to the regiments. What's more, they are not funded now by Ministry of Defense, and therefore the critical point is that they supposed to be now part of the community. So they go into our society, they're mutually supported by society. They're supposed to produce broader nar narrative. And also what's transpired from our project that um, absolute thousands of children go to military museums as a part of the educational tours. So that's the key. We have at least it's 9,000 children on a annual basis and use and frankly it's much much more and that i think is really disregarding the fact that they acting as a huge as a huge institutions of education and war making uh, so it's not really a situation don't like don't go and that's why i think what we would encourage uh, even um ir experts do not leave these sites because they they much more than that and I think what I want to show it's this picture and um, is that's kind of interesting because one on on the left side you can see it's a picture of um it's a Royal Regiment of Scotland it's infantry soldiers and it's part of the museum exhibition you invited to take selfie with um, uh, soldiers so and it's really interesting <laughs> it's very difficult to position yourself because if you're taking selfie otherwise you're standing just in front of them and they're directing weapons at you um so you have to position itself within the exhibition to take a selfie and then you're doing that from my point of view you're also taking on this geopolitical 
positioning where you're located within the system. And um, curator, by the way, found that the whole discussion about that quite disturbing and uncomfortable. But I think that's important that this kind of discourses are very common. They just perceived as not nothing to talk about. And then another thing, what was striking across all museums, it's constant reproduction of the racial discourse and racialized discourse. And it referring to the representation of colonial wars, but it's also constantly reproducing the representation of modern conflict or soldiers' lives. It's actually reproduced through the textual narratives as well, or through pictures like you can see on the screen of British soldiers that um, of, 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 of soul, kind of people dressed in African traditional dress. And these kind of pictures reproduce in Victorian era photographs. So for Russ was this absolutely unproblematized racialization and constant reproduction of hierarchies was seen as just absolutely normal. And I can tell you that and during the project, this lack of problematization was one of the, I would say, very difficult issues, especially during when conducting interviews because these discourses exist as, as utterly normalized within the spaces. And that's why I feel why it was interesting to do this kind of research. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think we probably now have to move on to, to Christine, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Um, and then we can go to Christine for, for uh, how she became interested in curating conflict and, and her paper. And we'll come back to you in the, in the next round. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. So good to see you and all my European colleagues there. Um, my uh, journey uh, to war in, uh, in, in curation of war is a, a sort of a long one, and I'm going to just mention highlights from it. Um, I started a lot of my career in Zimbabwe, where I was studying the post liberation period and actually a lot of rural women. And the rural women were telling me about what the war was like. And they were saying things that were not appearing in the leading narratives of the Zimbabwean war. And I became really interested in that at that time. Um, and I, you know, I have a book on women in progress in Zimbabwe from that time um, in which some of these stories are present, but I didn't really move on that particularly. Um, but I came back from Zimbabwe to the United States and <clears throat> entered into kind of a debate. I would call it a bit of a punch up, <laughs> an, an argument with feminists, all white women at the time, um, in the United States about what feminists should be studying. And they were arguing feminists are associated with peace. And if you study war, you are being complicit with it. I thought that that's nonsense. Um, well, how can we be doing this when so many women in the world are involved in war? What are they supposed to do? Just sort of put up the peace signal, uh, you know, sign and, and somehow it's all okay. So I was really angry uh, at that. Um, and then I started thinking more about that. And then I had this event that occurred in, <laughs> in Northern Ireland um, that really sort of focused me very much. And that was, I was asked to be an external examiner for a war course at the University of Ulster in Derry. And I said, yes, I'll do that because I wanted to go to the war zone in a sense. And I was, I was given these papers to read. And the best papers in my view all started with stories of the students from their own experiences in the war. I remember the day my father was shot, one of them began. He was sitting in the lounge on a chair in the lounge uh, in the lounge room and he was shot. And I'm like, whoa, I'm there and I'm reading it. And I saw that the, the instructor had given it a low mark. I'm thinking, oh, that's really weird. So then I read another one and it was very, very bland and boring and started with realist IR and never, never left it. There wasn't a single person in the paper and they got the highest mark. So I had to confront the board, which was really sort of an interesting experience. And I said, what is your criteria? What are your criteria for marking? And they said, there's no personal in IR. And in the study of I said, are you serious? You know, are you serious? You've got your experts sitting right there in your classroom. I'm not, you know, and I really realized at that point, I got to start changing this field if I can. And I did that as best I could. And I think that now it's a camp in the field. Clearly it's a, some, some place you can go. Um, 
Now, all of that then crept into a book that I wrote when I was a Lieberholm Fellow at SOAS for a while. Uh, my book on museums, Art Museums, International Relations, where we least expect it. I mean, I started to write about looting in the Iraq War and attacks on the Twin Towers and the rebuild uh, and ETA terror in the Basque country of Spain. And I just finally it culminated in 2019 and I was writing articles as well in this book that came out uh, curating and recurating the American wars in Vietnam and Iraq. And that, that's a, that article in the critical military studies is a subset in a sense of that book. So I've got to mention that that book considers the war knowledge that's put on display by curators at the Smithsonian Museum of American History and then what I call the ordinary curators, the non-professional curators that leave objects at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial on the National Mall, at Arlington Cemetery, and, and the, the types of objects and the types of descriptions and the types of stories that uh, occur in, in six war novels that are really acclaimed for these two wars. Uh, now, with the, the article, is, as I said, a subset. It's instead of looking at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which I give quite a bit of attention to in the book, I look at its facsimile. There's this half, half size facsimile called The War That Heals that is transported in gigantic transport trucks, American huge trucks, from veteran center to veteran center if they're invited. And they've been doing that since 1996. And they set up in a local park or a parking lot in, in, in some cases. Um, and a couple of them came to Connecticut when I was here and I went and I studied those as well and talked to people. And I found something very interesting among, <laughs> among many things. One is, is, is whereas the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was meant to be a non-political, it was not meant to litigate the Vietnam War again. It was meant to be for the veterans. That's why it's not called the, Viet the Vietnam War Memorial. It's called the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It was to help the, heal the veterans. Um, well, this, <laughs> either they're healed or they're, or they're still angry, but this is a very pro, very veterans are the greatest people um, type of exhibit uh, in this of all that heals. Um, and one thing that really struck me that I thought was really amazing and wasn't commented on is there, was a, there were photographs uh, placed on the side of a tent because all these are sort of impromptu uh, stagings and there were the portraits all the same size of the American presidents Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln and Larry. And Larry was a veteran who died you know in the Vietnam War in 1968 and his it was very interesting that the, that the politics of the situation uh, was that they were curating uh, the leadership, that the, the, the uh, experience of war actually elevates you into a position of such knowledge that you, you deserve to be placed equally with very, very esteemed presidents of the United States. I'm sure in your countries you could imagine a similar situation with your leaders, and it caused absolutely no controversy. No controversy. So I was writing about that, and then when you kind of um, I go to Arlington National Cemetery, which is my second case in that particular piece. Uh, suddenly, there's the the civilians. The civilians have taken over, in a sense, Section 60 of the Arlington Cemetery, which is for the, the American soldiers killed in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's the most active part of the cemetery. People are there. They're they're having drinks with their with their with their deceased relative. Uh, they're leaving all kinds of stuff all kinds of Christmas trees at Christmas and big balloons at birthdays and what have you. Or they're, or they're laying on, the, they're laying on the, the actual grave and they're crying. I mean, it's, a, it's extremely a, experience, a serious experience. Um, and the Department of Army that runs the Arlington Cemetery said, no, you can't do that anymore. We don't do that at military cemeteries. We don't festoon them. It's supposed to be a stoic community thing. And they just went to Congress and they went to the media, the, the, the civilians, and they said, you don't own these bodies because these are not just military bodies, they're also civilian. And their objects that are, that are placed there show that. And I thought it was a real interesting uh, contrast between the wall that heals, which is really like, oh, join the military today, and this, this fight that's going on. So um, just for very, very quickly, I'm currently doing research uh, comparing the Australian war 
Memorial and Museum with the uh, Peace Park of Hiroshima. Uh, I've spent considerable time on sabbatical and they are about as opposite as you can get. One is rah, rah, war, rah, rah. I mean, it takes you a lot, many, many days to get through the Australian War Museum. You think that they were the warriors of the, of the planet. And then you go to a very different place uh, where the civilians, there are no memorials to the military, Japan or American military, it's all civilians. So that's what I'm working on now. The, um, and thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. In which case, Enrique. Hi everyone. Um, Eileen, if you want to interrupt me at any time, feel free to do so and I'll uh, pass it to you. Um, so, my research is basically concerned with the idea of political violence and more, more specifically the ways in which we remember political violence um, and how those practices of remembrance, um, they're affected by a series of languages, they're, they're affected by a series of representational um, templates um, of many of the relationships between um, uh, signs and processes of material circulation that affect the ways in which you come to think about um, via, uh, phenomena, social phenomena, such as what we call political violence. Um, most specifically, I became very interested in, the, uh, well, to speak of political violence in, in Latin America, which is the area, or the southern corner of Latin America, which is specifically the area I look at, um, it is not possible without addressing the question of human rights and traditional justice, which became the two central languages that we come to speak of violence and militarism, if you may, as a process of, as a process of normalization of violence uh, or resort to violence in the region, specifically towards the end of the 20th century. Um, so long story told short, and I just got really interested in the work of these folks at the Resistance Memorial of Sao Paulo, which I just uh, posted in the chat. If you guys want to want to have a look at it, um, this is the English link. Um, if you can't see the English link, just there is a English or American flag um, to the up right, and you can you can change the language there. Um, essentially, what is this place? Um, when researching uh, the ways in which the clandestine leftist movements in Brazil were remembered and are still remembered in the country, I came across a group of people in Sao Paulo um, who were part of a center for the preservation of archives and stories concerning uh, contemporary political struggles in Brazil in the 20th century. Um, the story of the place itself is, is uh, particularly interesting. Um, it was originally the, the headquarters for a railway company in the 19th century. So if you can see the picture there, it's a beautiful, um, almost Mancunian-like building um, uh, with red bricks and whatnot in the city center of Sao Paulo, close to the central station. Uh, the railway company went bust at some point in the, in the early 20th century. And midway through the century, once McCarthyism um, and anti-communism really kicked in um, the southern corner of Latin America, that place was taken up by a, a political police. Um, so it became the offices of the Department of Social Political Order, also known as the DOPS, D-O-P-S. Um, so the DOPS was very, became very famous for operating in periods of democracy, in periods of dictatorship, in blended periods, um, essentially surveilling and um, repressing um, and persecuting anyone who, uh, whose bodies, ideas, behavior represented the slightest, the slightest of the slightest um, subversion, uh, to use the trendy term that, that was used back then, to the political order. So vagabonds, prostitutes, anarchists, um, 
uh, communists towards, towards the, the 50s, the 40s and 50s, well, you name it, they persecuted them all, homeless, all of that. Um, towards the 90s, no, the, the end of the 80s, when you come close to the process of redemocratization in Brazil, though starting in 79, many would argue, and went up all the way up to 88, 85, 88, it depends on the account. What you essentially have is that, that this Department of Social Political Order is dissolved, uh, and it, uh, the place is there, the place is left there. We don't know what to do with it. Um, eventually, it becomes um, uh, a police department for consumers' rights. Um, then that is dissolved as well. In the 90s, during the era of liberalization and new liberalization that were, we saw throughout the world, uh, you go through an architecture of renovation and there is an idea floated by the local authorities to make this former uh, headquarters of uh, political police, um, this documented site of torture and forced disappearances into the Freedom Memorial to celebrate um, the liberation or the, the ethos um, and the zeitgeist of uh, neoliberal Brazil in the 90s. Uh, that pisses off uh, quite a lot of political activists and former um, members of the, uh, the guerrilla former political prisoners who had been tortured in this place, who lost comrades in this place, um, who then eventually organized themselves and pressurized the local government to change this, this site towards uh, into a place called the Resistance Memorial, uh, which happens in 2009. Um, uh, sort of riding the, the wave of the pink tide in Latin America, the turn to the left in the region. Uh, right, so so what, Enrique? What, what, what interests you in this place? Uh, just a series, uh, a couple of things, three points that I wanted to talk um, about very quickly. Um, the first one is, uh, I mean, I think that the tone of my early career so far has been to try and build up bridges um, between Anglo-European I.O. scholarship and um, non-Anglo, non-European scholarship on very similar issues that for the, for the biggest part um, of the debates that we see in the field uh, isn't acknowledged for all the contribution that it can potentially, potentially make. Um, uh, this site, um, it's so rich, it possesses a wealth of historiographical archival research um, on a plethora of movements of, uh, in, in terms of uh, the articulation for justifications of armed struggle that would be analyzed by scholars in the North alongside the idea of terrorism. Um, so it presents a, dif a different possibility or the possibility for a different reading of phenomena uh, they're interpreted alongside the, the lenses of terrorism in the North. Um, it strikes at the heart of what... Oh, is that... Okay, sorry. I'll close it really. Uh, so it's basically bridge bridging a conversation, um, looking at how the language of human rights uh, and transition of justice promotes a colonization of possibilities for articulating claims of social justice in general. Uh, and uh, most importantly for this context, presents an opportunity for breaking uh, free from the, the cage or the template of warfare. Um, this place uh, enables us to look at militarism in the complete absence or articulations of militarism in the complete absence of warfare. And I find this interesting. Thank you, Enrique. Sorry that I have to be rude in like the, the chat bar sometimes. Um, it's not just you, I'm doing it to everybody. It's um, equal opportunities rudeness to, to everybody right now because I'm chair. No worries. <laughs> um, and to conclude 
this round, um, we now turn to Francesca to ask how she got interested in this topic and, and what is special about, about her case. Um, if you could try and limit it to like, you know, two to three minutes max, um, I'm gonna have to start policing a lot more rigorously now. Sure, okay, so kind of briefly, I mean, I guess I'd worked on Palestinian politics for some time, but had been more interested in, I guess, more um, traditional political movements. So the national movement, student activism, universities as sites of mobilization. Um, so that was my entry point. And then about, Five, six years ago, several new Palestinian uh, museums were opening around in or around the West Bank city of Ramallah. Um, and I was interested in that, I guess, kind of, you know, teaching students about classic studies of nationalism, where we might think of museums as these institutions of power. And I thought, well, how is this going to work for Palestinians when there's still an ongoing occupation? Um, and I mean, very briefly, I guess my case study that I looked at of the Palestinian Museum, like right from the outset, you could see how it was being limited by the occupation. So where it could be built. First, there was a plan that it would be built in Jerusalem. That was absolutely impossible. Then even where it was built kind of outside of Ramallah, you know, in, near a village um, where they could get kind of access and permission, who could visit it, what they could put in it, various artifacts were in Israeli museums despite being excavated in the occupied Palestinian territories or previously held by Palestinian institutions. Um, and so I think that was my starting point thinking, well, what is it that the museum is doing and how is it representing some forms of resistance? And what I found was that it actually, despite these limitations, it was doing a number of interesting things, um, but perhaps I'll leave it there and then I can come back to those things if there's time later. Sure, of course, yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so definitively, no matter who is talking at 10 past three, we will go to audience questions at 10 past three for the final section. So that leaves us um, a little bit of time. We really wanted to address the question of um, research methods because um, Candida's class have tuned in today. Um, her research methodology class have joined us, I believe. And so we thought it would be particularly useful to ask presenters to extremely briefly reflect on how their, their methodology, what methodology they used, how they accessed, um, you know, the case um, to find out um, details about kind of difficult or contested heritage. And we don't necessarily have time to go around everybody. Um, so if you don't want this question, then just feel free to say, you know, I can sit this one out. But I would like to go to, to Candida, definitely. Um, so Candida, would you like to kick us off on methods um, and how you use methods to find out about contested heritage or hegemonic heritage? Sure. So what do you mean this has to do? We were obviously taking a critical approach towards understanding where this figure of the Scottish soldier comes from. So we, we, we're post positivists, we're doing critical military studies. Uh, we're trying to unravel the actors and forces involved in reproducing the Scottish soldier every day. And as Natasha described, we've honed in on these, um, these military museums and the role of the curator in particular towards that. But not only the curator, when we access creators, we also accessed and started to begin to understand all the forces pressuring those in turn uh, in their role in reproducing the Scottish soldier in the museums. So it was this, this critical approach and broadly we described what we did as critical discourse analysis but we weren't just working with text because we understand discourse as coming from all uh, sorts of practices and processes and uh, floating around in the air and coming from all sorts of actors and forces. So it's the broad idea of discourse. And yeah, so we're in fact, we're, we're very, um, but how did we do that literally? Well, we visited, so we were doing ethnographic work and it's auto ethnography, participant ethnography, walking around um, 11 museums, uh, sometimes guided by going on the tour as a tourist, literally, um, and but also not quite literally because we're also we were also there as researchers, but but also tourists. Um, and 
So then reflecting on that, we'd go around the gift shop, we'd go in the cafe, experiencing everything about the museum, how it feels to be there, how it feels to take in these exhibitions and these displays. And you can see some of the pictures I've got there and that, that one of the selfie thing again. Me and Natasha actually did the selfie ourselves and I was trying to find that this morning, but I couldn't. So really going into the museum and just experiencing it, but also with that research question in mind, where does the Scottish soldier come from? How is it reproduced? What's shown, what's not shown? So with a focus on the invisibilities as well of the museum, always walking around thinking, well, what's not here? Um, whose bodies are on display? Who's, uh, what are the missing bodies and the voices and the stories not being told? So yeah, we did that and we also spoke to people. So we talked to, we interviewed 11 curators of the, the military museums, including um, the, the curator of the National Museum in Scotland. And yeah, and so that was interesting. And also this is where we realized we were starting, so it's a reflexive piece of work as well. Natasha has already explained her Russian, um, she's Russian. I'm English, you may have noticed, and we have another member of the team, Emma Dolan, who is Scottish, and we started to realise that we were interfering in this project through our very embodied selves and our identities. Natasha is Russian, I can't speak to Natasha, but I feel had an actually easier time kind of being the outsider and so obviously sometimes we would go me and Natasha would do an interview, I might go somewhere on my own, it all depended on our schedules. So we've become variables in this project and Emma comes with um as she described it as they kind of thought I would be understanding of all of this and that I kind of on on the side of the Scottish nationalist um on on the side of Scottish nationalism and then there's me who's the English like oppressor and there's this weird assumptions around all of us that kind of got in the way and then we're young uh we're free young-ish white women uh, we got, I got called, we and Natasha got called girls when we entered the, Scot the Scottish National Museum and then we go to meet the director. So we're walking to these really patriarchal masculine institutions with our questions and this all came to kind of cloud and get in the way and just be very emotionally draining. Um, yes, so that was what we, that was our, that was what we did and we tried to reflect upon all of that in, in, the, in the piece. But so yeah, that's about it on methods for me now because I know there's a lot of people to get through on the panel. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Um, I think um, because we've got nine minutes now until I'm going to cut everybody off to go to audience questions, um, I think it might be worth coming to Francesca with this specific question about methodology, because I know at some point um, when it opened, I think the museum you studied was empty of exhibits. I don't know if it still is, but could you talk to us about how you use methodology to study a museum? And what it does when it might actually be empty at some point. Sure, I mean, not to misrepresent it, there have subsequently been exhibitions, but yes, when it was opened, there wasn't a permanent collection. There still isn't a permanent collection per se that's very established. Um, and they didn't have an inaugural exhibition. And this was somewhat mocked in some of the Israeli media coverage saying, oh, well, this tells us about Palestinian history. There is no history, there's nothing in the museum but the board of directors and the people working in the museum kind of spent more time talking about well this actually exemplifies the problems we have in claiming our own history in having access to artifacts in moving things across places um, so they had got around this by having satellite exhibitions and digital archives which actually in these pandemic days you know are a kind of durable form of um, exhibiting things so I guess to speak specifically about my methodology, I mean, it began with a sort of online um, looking at what was available in the digital archive, what the media coverage had been at the time, and then going there and obviously having a European Union passport, I have an access that Palestinians do not have to the museum. So I was staying in Jerusalem and traveling to Birzeit, the village outside Ramallah, where the museum is, and was able to do that journey with relative ease. I mean, it was delayed obviously by Israeli military checkpoints, but those are journeys that many Palestinians just couldn't make. Um, so at that stage, then I was doing site visits and interviews um, with the staff and the board. And I think what I was interested in very briefly um, was how the people involved in it saw what the museum was doing. I mean, there was a criticism from um, some of the Israeli media, but there was also an internal Palestinian criticism about whether 
this was what the resistance should be doing. Should it be building these, spending money on these buildings that not everyone could go to? Was it a kind of elite endeavor? Um, and so I was interested in what the motivations were of the people working there and visiting it and how they saw it as this term samud of a kind of steadfastness um, of indigeneity, having a presence on the land and telling a narrative um, despite the difficulties. And it was that act despite the constraints that people saw the value in. Thank you. Um, six minutes until we cut for audience questions. Um, there is one question I'm, I'm dying to ask the panel. Um, I'm going to skip forward in the list that we gave them because we're, you know, running out of time. If the audience have no questions, then of course we can come back to some of these pre-planned questions. But I'm really keen to, to ask the panelists about how recent events um, surrounding the tearing down of um, statues of slave traders and um, Confederate history in particular, how recent events have um, affected your outlook on the curation of hello? contested history. Oh, hello, Eileen. How are you doing? You joined us. Sorry, I had a lot of trouble. I, I couldn't seem to get my microphone to work. We could, um, now that you've managed to join us, if you're, if you're happy to start on that question about how recent events, like the tearing down of statues of, of slave traders and the Confederate history, um, would you like to start on that question, how that's affected your outlook on the commemoration of conflict? Well, I think it's affected it in the sense that we all have stories to tell and they all matter. Because whenever I, I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm, well, I'm at the end, I'm approaching the end of my PhD in fine art and I'm using my experiences of the troubles because I was, I worked in Belfast at the height of the bombings. Well, one particular bomb, I thought I was no longer in this world, you know, so I really experienced a lot of the violence. And we don't want to go down that path again, but I think it's important to document it, to witness it. And what my exhibition is hoping to do, what I was saying in the article, is that there, we have been through this violence, but it didn't kill the compassion within society. And what we want to do is come through these traumatic events, but then use them towards building a better society. So with the Black Lives Matter, that was, it is so important in what everyone is saying. I was quite shocked actually at just, how much um, there are these negative attitudes still towards people of color and the slavery that still goes on. It's re it, really, it really quite shocked me the extent of that that there is in the world today. I thought we should have moved on from that because so of course we still need to and we do need to tell our stories and say to people that these things happened and we must understand what we can do with, with try to understand what caused these things to happen within Ireland with the troubles the political situation was a lot of the young men were in poverty and and giving them a cause to join gave them a purpose in life and I thought it was extremely sad I've been researching a lot you know not just my experiences of the troubles but experiences of others and there was an IRA man ex-IRA man and he actually was in tears before the camera saying what did we do? What was it all for? Which is quite tragic, but at least he's coming to an understanding that he was caught up in this violence, but now that he sees that really the violence just made tragedies and it didn't solve anything really. So we need to, we need to have dialogue. And I think working with everyone here, it is, I've been really, really able, pleased to do this. And I feel privileged to have been asked to put my work within all this because I've now connected not just within the art world, but with the, the world of international politics and relations. And that has um, opened up a global perspective on everything for me, which I'm really grateful for. Okay. I'm so happy that you were you were able to join us um, at this point. Um, we, we were looking for you earlier um, and couldn't find you. Um, before we go to audience questions, would anybody else on the panel like to speak to um, recent events and how that's affected their, their outlook on commemoration? Just jump in, anyone on the panel who would like to, to come in, or I will pick one of you. Then Desiree, it's you. <laughs> Thanks, Arlene. Um, 
Yeah, I, for me, the, what was going on with in 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 Bristol, wasn't it? And here, all over the the US, especially, cannot be separated from what Eileen was just talking about in terms of the the police killings of um, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests, which were also concomitant to a lot of specific targeted police killings all over Rio and Brazil of also Black Brazilians. Um, and what it pushed me to do was to undo the sometimes so quite present differentiation between the domestic and the international or, you know, a challenging of the deployment of the military at home for Black Lives Matter protests, but then not a challenging of its deployment abroad in the Middle East, in Central and South America, in Southeast Asia, etc. So it was a reminder that all of these struggles are connected and that the representation of the of the hegemonic also matters, but it needs to also be attached to a generative world making that comes from those who are most affected by um, by this hegemonic world system. I think my internet may have gone. I'm not sure. Um, I can still, we can hear you, you've frozen, but um, it's still partially there, I think. Yes, there it is, it's back. Um, at this point, okay. we've been past three time, and I promise okay. at this point we would... I think I can leave it at that. Sure. Um, audience members, if you have questions, would you like to raise your hand or type the question in the chat so that it can um, reach me and I can pose it for you if you'd rather not um, raise your hand and speak? So who would, uh, who would like to ask a question from our audience to any of the, the panellists? Raise your hand. Uh, oh, here, here is one in, in the. Um, Holly, would you like to turn on your microphone and ask your, your question? Sure, thank you very much. Can you hear me all? Thank you very much for a um, really fascinating um, early afternoon here. Um, I, I have a bit of a vested interest in this question, sorry, I, I'm, I'm doing a project on encounters with the enemy and I'm not a museum specialist, but I'm very interested in how the museum space, particularly when it's a national museum, um, spaces like the Imperial War Museum in Britain, um, think about the other side. Um, where there's already an implicit, like we are telling the British war narrative in that case. So I wondered um, if anybody on the panel had come across any interesting representations of the other side in the conflict and, and maybe how that's different where um, the other side can be more readily defined as a national army or, or when it becomes, um, a war on terror, a war on drugs, more diaphanous kinds of enemy. Okay, um, I notice you've referenced Christine in the in the question, so perhaps we could start with Christine responding to that. Uh, encounters with the enemy, I think, is really you know a very interesting topic, something that uh, that I'm interested in as well. Um, I was studying the uh, exhibition "The Price of Freedom: Americans at War" at the Smithsonian Institution at the Museum, American Museum, um, to see really how they were, what objects they were actually putting on display uh, uh, in this, this really a very elaborate display of every war the United States has dipped its toe into. Um, and so you get to the Vietnam towards the end and it's kind of like what to say about that one. Um, and what they say is they put on, a, uh, they, they, they put on exhibit this enormous Huey helicopter, all right, which was the, you know, the symbolic Americans in Vietnam. And it takes up tremendous space in a room that is a bit more narrow than it is wide. Um, and it's a very long, the tail of this particular, you know, helicopter is extraordinarily long. And there's, you know, there are these uh, uh, images of, of men uh, kind of being very carefully watching out for the enemy. So you think to yourself, if you don't know anything about the war, and if you're in a generation that has not been taught, and my students tell me, university students, that their courses in American history ended at the Vietnam War, and they never understood. They don't understand what actually happened there. Would I please explain it to them? I mean, it's really quite remarkable. Um, so then you walk along the hue and you think, well, you know, maybe they think that, uh, maybe my students would think the Americans won the war. <laughs> 
Because look at what their, their, their room is. The room is this Huey helicopter. Um, and the diorama with the soldiers and what have you. And then in poorly, and it's very well, it's, 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 the lighting is good, the staging is good. Huh? So then you get to the end of the tail and you look underneath and there is the Vietnamese bicycle. There's the Hanoi bicycle, the wooden bicycle with nothing on it, which is unusual. I mean, not, not carrying nothing, it used to carry up to 400 pounds or so, um, which is the actual weapon that won the war for the Vietnamese. And there's very little explanation there, you know? And in my particular research, I try to avoid curators. I try to avoid, I, I, my, my methodology was stillness and, and observation. I, I just, I wanted to see what they had there. I couldn't control myself. I had to say, I wanna see the curator of this. And I, the only interview in my, my book is, uh, is with the, the director of that particular exhibit who tends to agree with me. He said, Oh, I'm so glad you got that. I said, what do you mean got that? <laughs> she said, well, a lot of people walk by because they can't even really see it under there and they don't know what they're looking at and they have no idea that this is the, the most important weapon in the war against the United States. Um, and and you know, so he was, he was agreeing with me in the sense that, that this was a problematic display, but he said to me every year, I have to defend that particular object in the exhibit. I have to say why we need to have it. So that really tells you more than just about anything else I saw in that exhibit about what happens in national museums sometimes. The pressure of the various groups, the various sections. Yeah. Would any other panelists like to come forward on the representation of, of the enemy in uh, museums, memorials, artworks, or their, their own sites? Can I just say one other thing? By the way, the Australian War Museum is even worse. And they get, they have a Huey too, and they act like it was theirs, and they do the sound and light show of soldiers emerging out of the, the cockpit of the helicopter. I also asked to see the curator there too. <laughs> okay, um, we have a question from Neil. Neil, would you like to turn your microphone on and ask a question? Hi there. Uh, thanks very much for everybody's talks. Very interesting. Um, basically, uh, I was just interested in, you know, uh, museums as uh, colonial, uh, emanating from colonial practices in the first place, in the forms of collections of the exotic. Uh, and uh, uh, they're also class based as well, as well as, well as sort of uh, 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 other other uh, uh, aspects to their uh, nature which need to be understood better, I think. But the one which we is easy to orientate to is the nationalist orientation orientation of lots of the museums, especially war museums. And of course, you know, wars are often but not always fought along nationalist lines as well. And so I was just wondering, you know. How, hmm, as sites for curating uh, uh, wars in the present, whether the, the legacies of uh, museums were actually inherently problematic. And the, the second part of that question was around international museums being different from national museums. And I was just wondering whether uh, practices at international oriented museums would actually uh, uh, support or go against the first position of whether the museums were inherently uh, uh, nationalistic, uh, colonial, and that couldn't be resolved through practice itself, a new forms of practice of curation. So that, <clears throat> so that's what I was thinking. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in, see if anybody had anything interesting to say. Thank you, Neil. Um... Okay, Candida is recommending that Natasha, I was going to go to Candida and Natasha, but Candida has said that Natasha should answer this first. So Natasha, off you go. How, how would you respond to Neil's question? Um, thank you very much for this question. Um, sorry that I'm standing, I have a baby, <laughs> but it's sleeping, so it's all right. <laughs> um, I think it's, um, it's a very good question, but 
what was striking in our research, we obviously don't have level of international because it's military museums, but what we found out that actually national is also quite confusing. <laughs> it's very difficult to figure out what national identity actually means. And especially that transpires from the interview with curators um, who kind of trying to construct what's the purpose of the museum um, and create this British Scottish identity and kind of um, engage the web. And I think the question, what I think overcomes national identity is the question of museum positionality towards colonialism. And that, I think, is the key. Um, from my point of view, colonialism, especially in British museums, in the British context or in Scottish context, is utterly unproblematized. And to be honest, I would be frank, I don't think that current movements right now even produce any particular response from military museums, at least in Scotland. So what's happening, what we got in our interviews, it's that then we had direct questions about colonialism. For example, it's again referring to representation of the enemy and the fact that museums have lots of artifacts um, from colonial wars, but they usually presented sometimes without even identification what artifact is. And the same practices are introduced in regards to the global war on terror, when there are artifacts and they only signed as they obtained by British soldiers in a particular location. So they're not even assigned to who actually owned this particular artifact. So from my point of view, this kind of invisibility and complete and not on problematization of colonial legacy is, uh, is the key. And I wouldn't really put the blame on curators, to be honest. I think that's exactly referring to the third question, which uh, Charlotte posed in the beginning. I do believe that it's a question of collective efforts of, of society. And I think what transpired from our project, I think it also refers to Christine's argument. Curators exist in a hugely bureaucratic organization. Museum is a very, very complex institution. And to change one object for curator, you need to do lots of things. In our instance, I would say that the most difficult interviews were the women curators uh, who ask us to turn a uh, microphone off and talk really kind of um, emotional stories about how they encountered conflicts they, with their leadership and so on, usually about quite controversial artifacts referring to the role of women, for example. Uh, so it's just to, I think the question is broader I think society needs to recognize that these are the sites where colonial narrative is reproduced and they must be discussed. It's not just statues, it's just more than that and they must be problematized. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now have an array of, of hands up and um, questions to go to. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Anne Kierkegaard first, and then after Anne, we can go to Raquel. Good afternoon, thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentations. Um, I've got a question. I think perhaps my first thought was to direct it to Christine because we, have, we share um, a field, uh, original field of research, which is Zimbabwe. Um, but I think it's also a, a wider question. Um, I have never studied this part of the world. So um, I'm all my research has been going on in not Europe. <laughs> um, so I've been moving from Zimbabwe and into Iran and Western Asia. So um, and, and with an interest, I've always been interested in, in war museums and museums about conflict. Um, and in my case, then often decolonization processes. Um, and, and struggles against colonization. Um, so I think my, my, what the, the question that I have, and I'm particularly, you know, I'm working with um, uh, a particular museum at the moment, uh, which I find one of the most interesting museums I've ever been to. And it's a war museum, but it's also a peace museum at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so the question then is, because this is new to me, uh, I've got, just had a private interest before, but I'm trying to now to get into it as, as, an, as an academic. Uh, 
Um, so, Ujjav's been touching on that now, the decolonization processes and how they are portrayed uh, in museums and how they are curated and why they're curated that particular way. And uh, then how that looks in difference to uh, the colonial metropoles. Um, that would be even, I, I you know, I, I suppose even in a Scottish perspective, even though from my view, I would define Scotland as occupied, <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. sort of. Um, Northern Ireland, I know there have been uh, uh, sort of e-museums or, or mem um, sites of memorizing uh, the conflict uh, in Northern Ireland. I know the same is going on in Syria um, and in Tunisia. So there, there are a lot of different things that you could sort of go into that I, we don't have that time, but it's, it would be interesting to hear the, the, the panelists to you know, just reflect on the colonial aspects and, and the differences between colonial and colonizer um, and electronic versus in situ um, museums and, 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 and uh, memorizing spaces. Thank you. Uh, should I say so? I'll just say something quickly. Um, I haven't been studying that, that angle particularly, but what I'm very interested in is how it keeps popping up. Um, uh, in Australia, for example, the Australian War Museum, first of all, it's attached to a memorial to loss, the loss in Gallipoli in World War I. And then it's very quiet and solemn. And then you open the door and you enter this gigantic museum. It's the largest one I've seen of war and it takes days to go through it. And yet in that journey, through that extraordinary pro-war uh, museum, there's no, there's no sense of indigenous wars. There's no sense of wars against Aboriginal. You know? So the, the, the colonization internally is sort of missing. Now they, they're getting more and more uh, critique on this and they're promising to open up a new part of the, of the museum, a new building in order to do this. Now, why do they need to do that? You know, meanwhile, they're taking money from all of the corporations that actually produce uh, today's weapons in order to maintain the war orientation of the museum without looking at colonization. And the same thing is true in the Smithsonian and the Price of Freedom, Americans of War. You got to kind of look for the, for the uh, Native Americans. It, they're there in the beginning in the so-called Indian Wars you know, of movement westward and what have you. And then they disappear as if they've never been involved really in anything else and there's no internal colonization. Um, there's very little on race, race within say World War II forces at Vietnam in, in particular. It's just, it's very important to look at what's not there and what is there and what is getting. And again, to go back to what Natasha also underscored, these are really complex institutions. That's one of the reasons I wrote that book on art museums you know, international relations where we least expect it because they're international organizations, they're enormously powerful, they have tremendous resources, you know, and so the question of what they, how they are shaping an international and national public notion uh, of history or of warfare is really, I think, very, very central to all of our discussions um, here, but that should be more central in, in terms of uh, national politics. Um, this question might also be relevant for, for Eileen, um, possibly for some of Audrey's work as well, um, and, and Francesca as well. Would either of you three like to, to come in on this question? Yeah, I'd be happy to say something briefly. I mean, I think what people have been saying about this idea of ownership in the sort of conventional Western Metropole Museums is very true and it's interesting looking at examples like the Palestinian Museum and I think also in Desiree's case where the idea was less to be the owners of objects but more the custodians um, or you know seeing what a museum could um, display as in a more intangible sense so in the Palestinian Museum, they talked about the garden as being the permanent collection because that was something that they could actually have access to. So I think 
with some of the post-colonial perspectives or in the case of Palestinians, I mean, still actively being colonized, you have a, perhaps a more radical idea of what a museum could be. Yeah, um, can, I, can anyone hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that the, the Ulster Museum with, with Karen Logan, she's um, deliberately researching people's experiences. And that's very important because you've not only got all the soldiers and that side of things, but you've got the stories of people who had um, been, victim, been victims in during the troubles and women's stories, uh, which you know you often don't hear. And one of the things I'm doing with my own work when I exhibit it is I want to be very careful about sectarianism because that is you know a very big question in Northern Ireland and actually identity. I was interested in other people and other. Um, speakers talking about identity because growing up I almost felt as if I was in no man's land because you know my father was in the RAF I, I don't know if I can get any of my pictures um I was I was talking about sectarianism, the sectarianism and um, you know my father had been in the RAF and what I don't want to do with my work is be sectarian because it's a very, very tricky issue. When I was growing up, I felt, was I British? Was I Irish? Because if, because being from a Scottish Protestant background, some others, like Irish Catholics, would not look on me as really being Irish. And yet I felt whenever I went on to mainland Britain, I actually was on a train journey whenever I was a student and just coming to university for the first time. I was coming from Northern Ireland to Wales and it was an English girl in the carriage beside me. And she said, what's your passport like? And I said, well, I haven't been abroad yet. I don't have one. No, I meant to come to England. <laughs> she didn't realize Northern Ireland was actually part of the United Kingdom. I didn't need a passport to come from Northern Ireland. So it, it felt that you were in a kind of no man's land. So identity in Northern Ireland can be quite a tricky issue. And I was just interested in what people felt about identity. We have time um, for Raquel's question now, which um, could be perfectly uh, directed towards Enrique in particular, but maybe Desiree as well. So Raquel, would you like to ask your question? Sure, thank you. And thank you so much for the panel. So the, the, the question is, is um, really about how to curate political violence that comes from clandestine non-state groups, um, more often than not labeled as terrorists. Um, we rarely see that kind of um, curated violence, right? We see a lot of war uh, violence and all that, that, you know, some things you presented here today, but not this time that, you know, I don't need to explain what that would do, but because you all know, but uh, maybe I, I guess when Enrique started talking, I kind of thought that was going that way. But if you could maybe give some more uh, information about this, because just very quick, I always work with um, narratives of former violent militants, and I kind of always feel, yeah, but I can't create this, I can't use this, you know, because people don't want the stories of the violent militants, you know, the stories of the victims are much more appealing, you know, and, and all that. So, so yeah, so my question is around that. Thank you. Shall I answer it, Charlotte? Yeah. Um, hi, Raquel, thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> that's the that's the big question, isn't it? Um, I think that specifically in this particular museum that I'm looking at, the the Nuera de Resistencia in São Paulo, um, I think that that's tricky um, because we, the the curation is coming from um, it's mobilizing of the full language of human rights and transitional justice there. Um, looking at a context in which uh, mem former members of clandestine movements who took up arms against a, a dictatorial regime were the largest vic victims of that regime. So you have that problematization of those victims are not the usual victims that we, um, that we, by we I mean the liberal middle class humanitarian society is comfortable talking about, which is the prisoners of conscience and um, then play. So those weren't prisoners of conscience. Um, those individuals weren't even resisting uh, the rule of the generals. They were resisting the general system of exploitation on the capitalist social relations. So the one thing that is a taboo 
throughout the exposition is the question of revolutionary violence. Um, and quite understandably so, because once you start opening that box, um, once you start opening that box in the context of the that we're speaking right now and the rise of what, what amounts to a new fascist movement in the country, um, who happens to, roll, to, to hold the reins for the budget of that particular public space of memorialization, um, then you start thinking, if I, if I mention this violence, then I open space for the category of terrorism and then we're lost because there is no space um, for a meaningful discussion of political violence when we're still within the framework of terrorism. Terrorism is an analytical category. Terrorism is a moral category. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Um, it isn't a helpful category at all, I, the, the way I see it. Um, so I think that it is a, I don't have an answer in terms of how to do it. Um, I don't think the curators would have an answer either. Um, I think it's a pity because um, this is what's missing. This is what's missing from the picture, a real deep engagement with, um, because when once you lose sight of revolutionary violence, you don't talk about violence and militarization in the left or in any part of the spectrum for that matter, but you also lose the project of radical political change. Um, so you throw the baby away with the, with the bathwater, and I, but I don't think that's, that's easy to do. Um, so I hope that's, I hope that's enough. <laughs> Perfect. Not an easy question. Um, Desiree, did you want to come in on this, uh, this question? Um, and then I'll offer the floor to, to Audrey in case there's anything she'd like to address from the previous questions. Sure, and I'll, I'll keep it brief because I think actually the, the type of violence that the Museum of Marais actually, it's refusing to curate it, right? It's not curating the violence that is caused by the war on drugs. It's curating the experience of fear in the community. But it builds nicely on Enhiki's discussion because this is a kind of violence or crime in general is not deemed political, right? Crime is depoliticized. It's deemed a matter of interest, of a politics of the belly, right? Um, but they're not usually seen as groups that are demanding recognition or a, a change of the state, um, which is in itself a way of delegitimizing the kind, the politics of that violence, right? Um, others have turned to it to think about it as political because it is refusing to be the, the normative good subject and citizen. But anyway, so there is, the museum refused to curate this violence precisely because one, they didn't feel like they had an infrastructure to deal with a violence that is ongoing, right? Once you, you curate a problem that the community experiences now, you're also responsible for addressing it, for receiving residents, for, you know, you're, you have a responsibility over those stories and a responsibility of, of stories that are deeply misunderstood in Brazilian society, right? People think crime is just, it's just evil. It's similarly to terrorism, right? Um, but there, there wasn't, there isn't a consensus on whether or how this violence is political and then how to curate it in a way that is responsible and accountable to the residents that experience it every day. So they decided not to do that and to talk about fear instead. And I'm, I'll just leave it at that and let Audrey add her thoughts. Audrey, the floor is yours on uh, questions of colonialism, museums, or also um, kind of political violence from clandestine groups and, and museums. Thank you, Raquel, for your question. Um, the first thought that comes to me is uh, historicization. You know, like all um, insurgent movements come from a certain place, um, come in response to certain usually inequalities and, um, and prior forms of violence that have happened in history. And part of the problem with um, let's say dominant representations of these groups is that usually they're pre presented in ahistorical terms. So the key example for me is the 9-11 Memorial Museums, which starts with the attacks on the World Trade Center. And there's, there's no historical context provided regarding how did Al-Qaeda come to exist in the first place. So it seems to me that museums and memorials should do a better job at at contextualizing when where the movements come from 
And the second thing is um, the importance of, and I know that this may fall in the trap of like inclusivity, which Henrique and Desiree were talking about, but nonetheless, um, within the curatorial community, there are people of color and very often they are marginalized within the curatorial world. And um, so methodologically for me, what's been very interesting has been to talk to those people of color who are curators and the, the kind of silencing that they experience. And I, I don't really have like a, a kind of ready-made solution on um, how to like fight this kind of silencing. Uh, but nonetheless, it seems to me that um, like bringing a, a more diverse spectrum of, of voices of people who can be authoritative from the inside within museums and memorials is also part of how we can have um, like richer, more contextualized accounts of political violence that come from uh, different places around the world and not, not just the kind of wars, like liberal wars <laughs> waged by um, like great powers. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. This has been a really fascinating afternoon. Um...